Chapter One of Uganda's White Man of Work, a story of Alexander M. Mackay. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Uganda's White Man of Work, a story of Alexander M. Mackay by Sophia Lyon Fars. Chapter One. A newspaper man's interview with a black king it was a november morning in eighteen seventy five the london newsboys were selling unusually large numbers of the daily telegraph enough it was for the lads to cry latest news from stanley and every one wanted a copy mr stanley had written the story of his adventures in africa the black man's land down under the equator where the weather is too hot to be talked about he was exploring a lake named for Queen Victoria To reach this place the traveler and his men had marched through many regions where the native savages Had never seen the face of a white man Within sound of the roaring of lions and the cries of leopards and hyenas they had cut their trails through thick African jungles their course had led them to face drenching rains and the scorching rays of the tropical sun Again for days they had plodded along over parched deserts in search of water At other times they waded more than knee-deep through miry swamps steaming with heat More than once mr. Stanley and many of his men had been forced to lie in their tents helpless and burning with fever it is strange that a letter from such a correspondent was hailed with enthusiasm in London But who had brought the letter all the way to London from Stanley in the heart of Africa? Not a post office or mail carrier was to be found within a thousand miles of where Stanley was The black men had no railroads or mail coaches or even roads over which a coach might be pulled Little wonder then that the letter was seven months old when it appeared in the morning newspaper When one thinks of the way it came the marvel is that it ever reached England at all It is the story of a pair of boots a young Frenchman happening to be with mr. Stanley at the time wished to return to Europe Gladly taking the letter with him he and his caravan started on their homeward journey marching northward along the bank of the river Nile one day they were suddenly attacked by a band of savage tribesmen The Frenchman was killed and his corpse was heartlessly left lying unburied on the sand Later some English soldiers passing by discovered the dead body Hidden in one of the boots they found mr. Stanley's letter They quickly forwarded it to the English general in Egypt and from there it was sent to the newspaper office in London Was it by mere chance that the letter was preserved? Some who read the rest of the story may think that perhaps the great father who loves both black and white people had something to do with it But what had mr. Stanley written in this letter which all were so eager to read a Message very different from any he had ever sent home before yes very different too from that which anyone had expected from him Had he been a missionary his letter would not have proved so surprising but mr. Stanley was an explorer and newspaper correspondent Indeed many in England did not know that he even called himself a Christian Imagine then how they felt when they found that part of the letter read something like this King Mutisa of Uganda has been asking me about the white man's God Although I had not expected turning a missionary for days I have been telling this black king all the Bible stories I know so enthusiastic has he become that already he has determined to observe the Christian Sabbath as well as the Mohammedan Sabbath and all his great captains have consented to follow his example He has further caused the Ten Commandments as well as the Lord's Prayer and the Golden Commandment of our Saviour Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself to be written on boards for his daily reading Oh that some pious practical missionary will come here Mutisa would give him anything that he desired houses lands cattle ivory and other things He could call a province his own in one day It is not the mere preacher however that is wanted here It is the practical Christian who can teach people how to become Christians cure their diseases 
build dwellings teach farming and turn his hand to anything like a sailor this is the man who is wanted such a one if he can be found would become the savior of africa here gentlemen is your opportunity embrace it the people on the shores of victoria lake call upon you listen to them you need not fear to spend money upon this mission as mutisa is sole ruler and will repay its cost tenfold with ivory coffee otter skins of a very fine quality or even in cattle for the wealth of this country in these products is immense it was not till some time later that mr stanley told all the marvellous tale no one who heard it wondered any more that he had asked for missionaries to go to uganda this is how the story ran with his large company of followers he had begun the voyage northward on victoria lake toward uganda one clear morning they spied on the far horizon a fleet of canoes coming toward them as the canoes approached the white men caught sight of african oarsmen aboard better dressed than any other negroes they had seen in all their journey the black sailors hailed the white captain and when they were near enough to talk with each other they told him of a strange dream the mother of their king had dreamed two nights before she thought she saw on the lake a beautiful vessel having white wings like a bird on board was a white man with wonderful large eyes and long black hair the king on hearing the dream had sent these men to find the white man and to invite him to his court mr stanley could not do other than respond favorably to this royal invitation and as soon as possible he followed his new guides to the northern shore of the lake where lay their home country the kingdom of uganda a great surprise was in store for him when he landed on the beach stood two thousand people marshalled in two long parallel lines noisy salutes from numerous guns the waving of bright colored flags the beating of tom-toms and the blaring of trumpets all combined to express their glad welcome so many africans all neatly clad in long white robes with their chiefs arrayed in rich scarlet gowns made a spectacle new to mr stanley on his way to uganda he had passed through the countries of twenty or more african tribes but the people were all savages wearing little or nothing one could call clothes these waganda for that is the name of the people of uganda however seemed to him highly civilized the strange white guest was taken to the tent which had been made ready for his coming soon a herd of oxen was driven into the courtyard in front of the tent and then a number of goats and sheep on the ground a hundred bunches of bananas were piled by them was laid a queer heap of eatables including three dozen chickens four wooden dishes of milk four baskets of sweet potatoes fifty ears of green indian corn a basket of rice twenty dozen eggs and ten pots of uganda wine a most generous gift from the king whom the stranger had not yet seen when the day came for the white man to visit the king's court mr stanley with his large company marched along the broad well-built road leading to the top of a hill where stood a high dome-shaped hut built of reed grass in the doorway of this royal palace stood the tall slender figure of king mutisa his rich red costume with gold embroidery was very becoming to his graceful broad-shouldered figure and handsome face in his talk with mr stanley he showed himself bright and eager to learn all that he could to increase the greatness of his realm which was already no small kingdom most african nations were small tribes of a few hundred or thousand people and most so-called african kings were chiefs over a small group of african villages the kingdom of uganda was a most notable exception here was a country as large as the new england states with four million people all ruled by one powerful monarch nor did he rule in the fashion of most african chiefs his house of lords met daily in his palace for council these were his great chiefs or earls who ruled his provinces he had also his prime minister his chief judge his commander-in-chief for the large army of black soldiers and his grand admiral for the navy of canoes to the white man 
Mutisa seemed like some great Caesar of Africa Mr. Stanley while still a lad had told some of his boy friends that when he became a man he was going to be a missionary This resolve of his boyhood days however had slipped from his mind as he became older now in Uganda where he was talking daily with this great African king there came back to him the longing he had when a boy and he wished to know how to be a missionary if David Livingstone were only alive and here in Uganda he thought to himself what a wonderful work he would do for should King Mutisa and his millions of subjects become Christians they in turn would make the best kind of missionaries to the savage tribes all about them but Mutisa and his people were heathen this does not mean that they worshipped idols for had one searched throughout the whole country of Uganda He probably would not have found a single image He would have seen however here and there along the roadside usually under the shade of some tree or on the top of a mountain Little huts so small he might have thought they were playhouses for the little Uganda children But they were used for a very different purpose to these tiny grass huts the Waganda went to sacrifice they believed there was a great God who many hundred years ago created the whole world But since men had become very wicked this God grew angry and would have nothing more to do with the world It was no use therefore to pray to him for he would never listen instead they worshipped different kinds of evil spirits These spirits lived in trees or in the mountains or on the lake or sometimes even in persons and the Waganda thought they would do much harm unless presents were given to them Tied to one of the little sacred huts or to a tree beside it might be seen some of these gifts walking around Several sheep or goats or cows Peeping inside the hut one might discover also a bunch of bananas or several skin bottles filled with pomb Which is a Uganda wine made from bananas? The ugly old man or woman who is guardian of the prayer hut keeps these gifts until the evil spirit is supposed to have taken all he wishes to eat Then the guardian gives himself a treat So the poor Waganda used to pray to these evil spirits by giving them presents not of course because they loved the spirits But because they were afraid of them There was another religion also very different from this heathen spirit worship about which Mutisa had heard a good deal for about 50 years Arab merchants had been coming into Uganda to trade calico wire beads and various trinkets for native ivory and slaves There is one true God these merchants said and his greatest prophet is Muhammad To him God gave great power to do miracles and to conquer many nations Now millions upon millions of people worship him in dreams Muhammad was told by God many wonderful things about heaven and hell and he has given his followers some good commandments To Mutisa the stories they told of Muhammad seemed far more wonderful than the foolish tales he had heard of the evil spirits in Uganda and he felt almost like becoming a Mohammedan He began to wear the Mohammedan dress and turban he taught his chiefs Mohammedan customs and he kept the Mohammedan Sabbath Thus mr. Stanley found Mutisa half heathen and half Mohammedan never having heard that to be a Christian was better than either Day after day passed and each day King Mutisa and mr. Stanley talked together on many subjects The Explorer hesitated to speak of the Christians God for he knew not whether Mutisa would be glad or angry to hear of him one day at court when the chiefs were all present some one of his own accord asked mr Stanley to tell them of the white man's God as He began to tell of God the loving father and of Jesus Christ his son Mr. Stanley noticed that the king and courtiers were listening more intently than he had ever known them to listen before Until that day it had always been thought polite to talk about any one subject for a short time only but now these black men seemed to forget to become wearied Each succeeding day mr. Stanley continued to talk on this same subject His hearers appeared far more interested in what he said about Jesus than they had ever been in any of the wonderful things He had told about civilized people Mr. Stanley's visit with Mutisa lasted for some months 
when it became known that he was soon to leave the country someone suggested that at least a few of the things the white man had said should be written down so that they would not be forgotten by good fortune there were two lads who together could do the translating and writing one was the king's chief drummer the other was one of mr stanley's boat boys so on thin polished boards of white wood each about a foot square they wrote the ten commandments and some of the most striking stories of the old and new testaments until the waganda had a little library of board books one memorable day king mutisa called to him his chiefs the officers of his guard and mr stanley when all were seated before him some on the floor and some on stools in his palace hut mutisa began to speak when I became king he said in the language of his country I delighted in shedding blood because I knew no better I was only following the customs of my fathers But when an Arab trader came and taught me the Mohammedan religion I gave up the example of my fathers and beheadings became less frequent No man can say that since that day he has seen Mutisa drunk with pom but there were a great many things I could not understand and some things which seemed very unreasonable But no one in Uganda was able to explain them to me now God be thanked a white man Standy has come to Uganda with a book older than the Quran sacred book of Muhammad My boys have read out of it to me and I find it is a great deal better than the book of Muhammad besides it is the first and oldest book the Prophet Musa Moses wrote some of it a long long time before Muhammad was born as Kintu our first king was a long time before me So Musa was before Muhammad now. I want you my chiefs and soldiers to tell me what we shall do Shall we believe in Isa Jesus and Musa or in Muhammad one of the group Chabarango by name spoke up let us take that which is the best but came a reply from the Prime Minister we do not know which is the best the Arabs say their book is the best and the white men say their book is the best how then can we know which speaks the truth then Kauta the King's steward said when Mutisa became a son of Muhammad he taught me and I became one if my master says he taught me wrong having got more knowledge he can now teach me right I am waiting to hear his words Pleased at this Mutisa again addressed his chiefs Kata speaks well if I taught him how to become a Mohammedan I did it because I believed it to be good Chambarango says let us take that which is best true I want that which is the best and I want the true book but the Katikiro Prime Minister asks how are we to know which is true and I will answer him listen to me the Arabs and the white men behave exactly as they are taught in their books do they not the Arabs come here for ivory and slaves and we have seen that they do not always speak the truth and that they buy men of their own color and treat them badly putting them in chains and beating them the white men when offered slaves refuse them saying shall we make our brothers slaves no we are all sons of God I have not heard a white man tell a lie yet Speak came here behaved well and went his way home with his brother speak and grant were earlier explorers in Africa They bought no slaves and the time they were in Uganda. They were very good Standy came here and he would take no slaves what Arab would have refused slaves like these white men Though we deal in slaves. It is no reason why it should not be bad and when I think that the Arabs and the white men do as they are taught I say that the white men are greatly superior to the Arabs and I think therefore that their book must be a better book than Muhammad's and of all that Standy has read from this book I see nothing too hard for me to believe I have listened to it all well pleased and now I ask you shall we accept this book or Muhammad's book as our guide seeing clearly just what the king wanted they all answered we will take the white men's book thus it was that mutisa announced himself a follower of the christ and the christian's book he promised to build a church and begged that other white men might come to teach him and his people about the good way 
Standy, he said, say to the white people when you write to them that I am like a man sitting in darkness or born blind, and that all I ask is that I may be taught how to see, and I shall continue a Christian while I live. Such an appeal Mr. Stanley could not let pass unheeded, and the letter was written to the Daily Telegraph. But the newspaper correspondent had asked a very hard thing. London folk had heard before of King Mutisa of Uganda. Two earlier travellers had told very different stories of this great heathen monarch, which was to be believed. They had said that in Mutisa's court a fair trial was never known. If one of the king's chiefs failed to salute his majesty properly, his head was in danger. If his bark cloth dress was not tied over his right shoulder according to the proper fashion, Mutisa was likely to order the man to be put to death. In an instant, every one near the offender would rise, drums would be beaten, drowning the man's cries for mercy, and the unfortunate victim would be dragged off to his fate. Even the king's three or four hundred wives lived in daily fear of death by order of their master. Such was the king whom Stanley was now saying wanted Christian teachers. Who knew but that he might not soon tire of white men too, and order their lives also to be taken? Then, too, the young men of England thought of the long and dangerous journey across the country with no railroads. They thought of the wild animals, of the deadly hot climate, and of the savage and cannibal chiefs throughout whose countries they would pass. They pictured the loneliness of living so many months away from all their white friends and loved ones. What joy would there be in living in a small grass hut with mud floors and no windows? Why should any man who might some day be an honoured clergyman in a peaceful town in England go to this uncivilised land and be his own butcher, baker and candlestick maker? Was there even one man in England who would take Mr. Stanley's letter seriously? Would any one be willing to leave home and friends and risk his life just because a black king in the heart of Africa plotting perhaps for the white man's life had asked for a missionary moreover one man could not go alone a number of men would have to be found who would go in a party thousands of dollars would be needed for travelling expenses alone was this undertaking worth all it might cost what would come of mr stanley's letter end of chapter one